The American Petroleum Institute and Howell Training present Catalytic Reforming. Refining processes have historically been developed to meet the ever-increasing demands for gasoline. These demands have brought about many changes in refinery operations, as well as the development of entirely new processes. Processes like fluid catalytic cracking and alkylation were developed during World War II to increase the production of motor and aviation gasolines. After the war, a need developed for higher octane gasolines, which could meet the requirements of automobiles with high compression engines. One way to enhance the octane number was to add tetraethyl or tetramethyl lead to the gasoline. In the 1970s, however, the Environmental Protection Agency ordered a gradual phase down of the lead content in gasoline. Fortunately, another method had already been introduced that could improve the octane rating of gasoline. This method, called catalytic reforming, uses a series of chemical reactions to create high octane gasoline blending components. To understand how catalytic reforming works, you need to know a little about the chemistry of crude oil. Crude oil is composed of hydrogen and carbon atoms that have bonded together to form molecules called hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are formed in a variety of different shapes and sizes. They range from small, simple molecules to large, complex compounds. The characteristics of a particular hydrocarbon such as its boiling point, flash point, and color, are determined by the size and structure of the molecule. It is these characteristics that determine what types of products various hydrocarbons can be used in. Basically, hydrocarbons can be grouped into four major series or classes according to the way they are structured. These are the paraffins, olefins, naphthenes, and aromatics. The hydrocarbons within each class have bonded together in a similar manner and have many of the same characteristics. In terms of gasoline blending, the characteristic we are most concerned with is octane number, and the highest octane numbers are found in the aromatic class of hydrocarbons. This brings us back to the purpose of catalytic reforming, which is to convert paraffins and naphthenes into high-octane aromatic compounds. But how is this accomplished? Catalytic reforming uses heat, pressure, and a catalyst to rearrange or reform the structure of hydrocarbon molecules. The feed to a catalytic reformer is usually a low-octane naphtha. The feed is primarily composed of paraffins and naphthenes, which explains the low-octane rating. Reforming occurs inside a series of reactors where the feed is contacted with the catalyst. The catalyst promotes several chemical reactions which reform paraffins and naphthenes into high-octane aromatic compounds. The produced by catalytic reforming is called reformate. Reformate may be used as a petrochemical feedstock or as a gasoline blending component. Secondary reforming products include hydrogen, along with some light hydrocarbons. In the next segment of the program, we'll take a closer look at the reformer equipment. But first, you need to know more about the characteristics of different hydrocarbons and how they react during the reforming process. Stop the tape and turn to workbook period one. Segment of the program, we'll take a look at the equipment that makes up a catalytic reforming unit and discuss what happens to the feed as it passes through each section of the reformer. The feed is usually given some type of pretreatment prior to entering the reformer. In most refineries, this means sending the naphtha through a process called hydrotreating or desulfurization. Hydrotreating removes contaminants in the feed, such as sulfur, lead, arsenic, and nitrogen. These impurities must be taken out of the feed, or they will be deposited on the reforming catalyst and damage it. When the naphtha is free of contaminants, it is ready to be reformed. 
The equipment in a typical reformer consists of three or more reactors, a furnace, a separator, a stabilizer, and a recycle compressor. The first step in reforming is to mix the feed with a hydrogen-rich gas and then heat this mixture in a furnace to around 900 to 950 degrees Fahrenheit. This temperature is sufficient to totally vaporize the feed and allows the desired reactions to take place. Next, the vaporized feed and hydrogen are charged to a reactor where they come into contact with the catalyst. The catalyst promotes several chemical reactions which rearrange or reform the structure of the hydrocarbon molecules. In most reforming units, the feed must be processed through three or more reactors to obtain the desired product. The naphtha is further reformed as it passes through each reactor. The product of one reactor is always reheated in a furnace prior to entering the next reactor. This is because the net effect of the reforming reactions is endothermic, meaning that heat is absorbed. So reheating is necessary to keep the reactors operating at the proper temperature. The product from the last reactor is cooled and liquefied and then sent to a separator. The product is condensed so that it can easily be removed from the hydrogen that is produced by the reforming reactions. Much of this hydrogen is recycled and mixed with fresh reactor feed. This is done to maintain a high concentration of hydrogen in the reactors. The amount of hydrogen in the reactors must be kept above a certain level or the catalyst will be damaged. The liquid product from the separator is sent to a stabilizer. The purpose of stabilization is to separate out light hydrocarbon gases that were created by the reforming reactions. The product drawn from the bottom of this vessel is the stabilized reformate. During the reforming process, coke or carbon is gradually deposited on the catalyst. As this happens, the catalyst's ability to reform the feed declines, so eventually the coke must be removed. The catalyst is cleaned or regenerated by burning the coke off its surface. Reforming units are often classified by the method they use to regenerate the catalyst. Basically, there are three different ways to do this. The first type of unit is called a semi-regenerative reformer. With this type of reformer, the reactors run several months or more between regenerations. When the catalyst needs cleaning, the entire unit is taken off stream so that all of the catalyst can be regenerated at the same time. The main disadvantage of this method is that a complete shutdown is required to clean the catalyst. Some units are equipped with a swing reactor so that part of the catalyst in the system can be regenerated while the other three reactors are in operation. This is called a cyclic reformer. Because the catalyst is cleaned in cycles, it is not necessary to shut down the unit for regeneration. A third way to regenerate the catalyst is with a continuous reformer. With this method, a portion of the catalyst is continuously removed to a separate regenerator, where it is cleaned and then returned to the system. Catalyst regeneration usually involves more than just burning off the coke. The catalyst is usually treated with chemicals to help restore it to its original activity. This treatment will vary depending on the type of catalyst that is being used. Let's take a closer look at how the catalyst is regenerated and how the reforming equipment works. Stop the tape and turn to workbook period two. In this part of the program, we'll take a look at some of the major operating conditions or variables that must be controlled during the catalytic reforming process. We'll also discuss how these variables affect product yields and quality. Normally, 
a reformer is operated to produce the maximum amount of reformate that meets a specified octane number. This chart shows the relationship that exists between octane number and yields. You can see that as the octane number goes up, the volume of reformate produced goes down. So the higher the octane specifications, the less reformate we are able to produce. This means that if the unit is producing reformate that is above octane specifications, product is being needlessly wasted. 